here we go. So, Bolita, thank you for coming on to talk to me. So, where I might start, I mean, I've been thinking about about sex recently as <laughs> have you <laughs> <laughs> but through the kind of critical lens that i tend to take on things and i was thinking well we we're in this interesting situation i think certainly it seems in my english speaking world where we're sexually liberated in one sense but also don't actually talk about it that much in public in the media at all and when there are conversations about sex and particularly to do with like, like pornography or sex work, it pretty much is filtered between is it good or is it bad? And that's about as far as we get with it. And so there's no actual exploration down into questions more. What is this thing? And what forms does it take? And like, is it a form of art? Which increasingly I'm finding, yes, yes absolutely. It's, it's a form of art. And you guys who are, who are working in it, producing and acting or creating a, what can be quite a valuable and meaningful cultural product. So I suppose with that introduction, I was wondering if I could just ask, ask you to share a bit about your own journey and what's brought you into this world and perhaps what you're doing with Lustery at the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, first of all, I absolutely agree with you. I think um, it feels like we've come a long way and I guess we have come a long way. Uh, however, I would say we're still at the very early steps of like having an adult <laughs> conversation in society about sex and sexuality. I think uh, it feels like sex is everywhere and like there's so many things that are sexualized uh, such as you know publicity and you know a lot of uh, things but actually the way we talk about sexuality and especially um, yeah yes anything has to do with communication um, about sex and sexuality is very very scarce i think and there's a lot of work to do um i think for myself like I, I come from spain which is a very um catholic and quite fascist country <laughs> uh so i grew up i was very lucky i grew up with uh like my father and mother they were atheists and feminists and so they gave me they raised me in a very like um political and critical um environment but i was always like you know fighting with all of the rest of the children at school <laughs> about these topics and sex was definitely something that i was very interested in from a very early age um and that i was very felt very conflicted about because of yeah because of growing up in a society that was not welcoming like people to talk openly about sex especially not as a as a woman right mm. so um for me like one of the reasons that i left spain was that like feeling that i was drowning somehow uh, and I moved to Berlin also right after school when I was 17 and I found here um, like for me coming here and meeting people that there's a lot of like sexual expats here I would say or a lot of people come to Berlin somehow like searching for exploring their sexuality in a more free way because there's so many spaces in Berlin where you could do that uh, which is a you know huge privilege to be able to do that um, so I came here and met a bunch of like queer feminists that were doing porn um, and I thought, so I was raised a feminist, but I thought um, that like pornography and all kinds of sex work was tools of the patriarchy to exploit women, right? So this like sex negative um, way of feminist thought. Uh, and then I came here and met all these feminists who were like, no, actually you can use pornography in a political way, um, you know, in order to create imageries about the diverse bodies and sexualities and sex. And I was like, oh my God, that's so awesome. I can do porn and be feminist. <laughs> Um, and yeah, basically, I mean, I've been doing that for the last 10 years. I started, so my background is again, very privileged. Like my access to understand pornography and how to use it was very academic. Like in, you know, I had, you know, gender studies seminars that were about that. Um, and I, like I say, I spent much more time talking about doing porn and actually doing porn also at the very beginning. And it was like in a very safer space with, um, again, like we were doing porn, not for the money, like not out of, you know, any like financial necessity but actually just really out of a conviction of like this is the thing that we need to do to liberate ourselves to gain our sexual agency uh, and yeah to explore our sexuality so yeah and it was like diy queer you know no money involved and then after a while i realized well i can also earn money with this which is not bad um so i you know i've been exploring different kinds of sex work and especially in pornography and soon i started to produce myself more than acting although i love acting in front of a camera but more for like personal like exhibitionist reasons <laughs> and um 
But uh, yeah, so like three years ago, we launched Lustry, which is a platform where couples all over the world can send us their sex videos. The only condition is that they actually do have a sexual relationship going on in their private lives. Um, and that they are shooting it like in their intimacy of their own of their own places and they're shooting it themselves with nobody else in the room. Um, so it's kind of like a, yeah, for me, it's like an archive of feelings of love relationships and sex. Mm, wow. There's a lot I could open <laughs> up and explore there. You know, I'm, I'm interested to come back to this idea about like Berlin being this, the place for sex expats and the fact that you've got what you said, a bunch of queer and feminist porn producers, performers there. Like, one of the things I think I've noticed in recent times, I would say, as as a consumer, I don't even, I don't like the word consumer, but I'll run with it for now, mm-hmm. is that there feels to be some some real difference between some of the stuff that's coming out, say, of, of Europe and the, the Berlin scene and what I might call more mainstream American style porn. Mm-hmm. And whether that's a difference in just how it's like dressed up and sold between like big tits chick gets fucked versus actually like a, a scene with a bit more story to it and a bit more, what would I say? Drama, tension, emotion, all of these things that come out of it. Um, what do you think about that kind of, is it fair to describe it as there being a kind of split perhaps, or that this is a, a new thing that's coming up of reacting against what has been going on from a more American model? Mm-hmm. Um, well, as you were saying at the very beginning of our conversation, you know, we tend to approach these topics as in good and bad, right or wrong, you know what I mean, mainstream uh, alternative. And as far as I think those, um, I mean, those are like parameters that we can, can use to look at the, the, the product that pornography is, I think we have to be very careful with doing this like binary, like, you know, American mainstream, European alternative. So, um, I just think like when we, there's a tendency to talk about mainstream pornography as if it was like a monolithic, homogenic product. And that I think it's not, doesn't quite like um, acknowledge the reality of mainstream, of like, you know, commercial pornography, which is huge. It's a huge industry. Only in the US, it's a huge industry. And there's really different genres. You know what I mean? It's like from, sure, there's like chick with big tits being fucked, but there's also like femdom and kink. And, you know, like there's so many things. Uh, and so many different productions from like glam, uh, you know, super high budgeted productions with like amazing cars and makeup and costumes to like super gonzo, you know. So there's so many things that I um, that I think it's important to acknowledge that because we tend to say like, oh, there's so many like bad, we, you know, we tend to pr- portray mainstream pornography as if it was so like bad for society because it gives us like wrong representation of beauty and of sexuality. And I'm like, well, I think there's more diversity in porn, in mainstream US American porn than in Hollywood, for example, in terms of like bodies and sexuality and, you know, so just, just like that, just to start, like, don't, I don't like to like demonize, you know, mainstream. Oh, yeah, porn. that's a good point. I- repeated the very thing that i actually mentioned at the start that's that's interesting that that's still kind of playing out unconsciously anyway See, because it's everywhere mm. yeah it's everywhere i think for for myself like when i started doing porn i also thought like oh i'm gonna do good porn right and there's all this bad porn out there and i'm doing it as you're saying like i'm doing it as a reaction to that and then like as, as i went along i realized uh no i'm actually not doing like the porn that i'm doing i'm not doing it like like as an yeah versus or like as a response to mainstream porn whatever that may be or how we define it i'm actually doing it as a response to mainstream media like society not like everything i mean like hollywood films and and music and like industry and all of this like i think that there is a lack of of diversity and of like reflection on gender roles and so on in, in in all these mainstream industries right and again, I don't think there's nothing inherently like more sexist or anything in, in the porn industry than there is in the music industry or the film industry, you know? Um, so for me, like, and I still think like their porn, like whatever porn you do, you're going to be stigmatized for it. Surely like there's the same, like in sex work, there's like a horocracy, right? Like depending on what kind of sex work you do, you're going to be like, you're going to have different reactions from people and, you know, um, so for sure in porn, there's also like that kind of hierarchy. Like if you're like, no, I do like, good feminist porn I'm doing quotation mark with my fingers uh you know it feels like you're some better than you if you're doing like what king mainstream porn but i don't think so at all i think like 
there is a stigma and like sex negativity in society. And I think porn, whatever kind of porn, is brings us the possibility to start up a conversation, to start talking about something, to start like, you know, dismantling like this fear and shame that we feel around sex. So I feel way more like solidarity with everyone involved in doing porn or sex work in general than this like so I wouldn't like, you know, work so much or go like this like split like the like mainstream versus alternative i'm like no we're also all making porn and it's like there's synergies you know like performers wise and and, and aesthetic wise like it's a, surely like there's differences but also these differences have to do a lot with the means of production you know like if, if you have a major company and you have to put out like one movie a day obviously you're going to be mass producing uh and of course that's going to affect or that's going to like form like how your movies look if you're like an independent artist in berlin that does like one short film a year like of course that's gonna look different you know um but it's but it's just different yeah it's just different genres and different forms right you also wouldn't compare like yeah again like hollywood like star wars series with like independent filmmaking in you know yeah in like a little place in the south of europe or whatever so yeah, I think there's, there's just differences and it's, um, it's not like versus, but it's more, I think it, it's more for me, it's more like I'm celebrating the diversity that there is actually, because people are not, when we, t we talk about porn, people just think about like one kind of gender and they do not, they're not aware of the fact that there's a lot more diversity than that. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I like that idea that you said about doing it almost as a reaction just against the media in general. Like... You know, and I started thinking about this way that we still have this standard that it's almost, it's, it's taboo to show a female nipple on a screen before exactly. nine o'clock or to have any in-depth conversation about sexuality, any kind of mature adult conversation about sexuality. You can sort of tiptoe around it, but if you actually use the word pussy or dick or blowjob, anything, people are going to be like, oh, how dare you? But... But it's there and we all know it's there and it's like 70% of the internet or something. Yeah. something. I'm probably making that statistic up, but it's, it's huge. It's <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so society we've got on the one hand, it's like we still pretend that we are, well, I don't know if it's still pretending, but we do pretend that we're not that engaged in sexuality, but then beneath the surface, it's all there. And I'm wondering, do you have any thoughts as to why it is that there's still like, it won't be acknowledged up here? I think that it has a lot to do just with like the legacy of, of religion, of like totalitarian systems. Like, I mean, sexuality is something that has been used by many different systems to control people. You know, if you like, if you make very severe rules <laughs> uh, and control people's sexuality and, you know, the institution of marriage and all of this, um it's just been a very powerful tool you know uh for many for societies and i think especially like yeah monotheist mono, well, monotheist religions um have really like taken on to that um to control people and i think even if we um feel like okay maybe like in our generation we've grown up way more free from that this is this is still like internalized um ideology that we carry around right and, and i think like for example I, you know talk for myself growing up in Spain, which is a very Catholic country, as I said, like this whole Catholics are like obsessed with sex, obviously. And it's a whole thing about shame, uh, you know, and there's like a very morbid way of approaching like a lot of representations of like very sexualized uh, kink stuff, actually, I'd say, <laughs> but with a lot of like shame and you're not allowed to talk about it and like virginity and this whole, all these symbols, they're just making it really hard for us to have a healthy relationship with their own sexuality because you're putting all these barriers uh i think you know for us just being like oh i'm just gonna explore my body and like, feel it and see how it feels and then i'm gonna explore someone else's body it's just so weird so i mean my father grew up and he thought he was gonna get blind if he would masturbate right and this is my father not even my grandfather <laughs> so it's not that far away you know so i think it's if you if we look at that it's very clear why we have like a relief you know, fucked up relationship with sexuality and why there's still like a long way to go because uh, we're lacking all the resources that we need like in terms of just starting by like anatomy knowledge like until I didn't know how a clitoris looked like until like five years ago and a lot of people still think clitoris is just this little 
thing over the vulva, right? And they don't know that it has like these long legs or whatever they're called. See, I don't even know. <laughs> um, right? So just like basic anatomy and knowledge about our bodies is, is lacking. And, it's, and then like, of course, there's sex education is in school. It's just about like, yeah, very like limited anatomy and like sexual uh, uh, transmitted diseases and that's it. So we're lacking so much like access to, to proper education uh, and, and, and also, yeah, that's the freedom and the space to be able to explore by ourselves and enjoy sexuality without all those horrible feelings. Oh, like that point about school. Exactly. I remember we got, we got sexually transmitted infections and we got put a condom on a banana. And that's, exactly. That's as far as it goes. It. And then it's like, right, go forth and explore. And it's like, well, okay. Where do I <laughs> and <start>? then... <laughs> And then there's just like a billion, billion videos on Pornhub, but then no actual like guidance. And you think in pretty much every other area of life, we recognize the value of like having teachers or mentors or role models or people who will, will initiate you into something and show you how it's done. But just like within sexuality, that doesn't seem to be that at all. No, it is secrecy and silence, right? So yeah, it's like, also I think it's so interesting. People are like, oh, like, yeah, they, they're like, oh, there's all this intern- like porn in the internet out there, as you say, and like children have access to it, and everyone is like, oh, it's so horrible. They're going to, you know, they're influ-. First of all, there's not really a study that proves that like young people really have a fucked up relationship to their bodies or sexuality because of, like, directly because of watching porn. There's not been really been proved. But also, yes, this idea that, that teenagers are not able to differentiate between like what they're seeing on the screen and reality. It's like as if you would like think that you know, teenagers watch, I love to take this example, like Fast and Furious, and then you're just gonna, like, they're gonna think that's the way you drive a car. She's like, no, of course not. They also, like, they know that that's not the way you drive a car. It's a fiction film. But also, they're taught you're not allowed to drive a car and you have to take a test and so on and so forth. So as you're saying, like, you know, you would, like, you would appreciate someone telling them and talking about that and talking to them about porn uh, and what they're seeing in porn. But yeah, that's, that's the problem. So the problem is not porn. The problem is you're not talking to your children, right? Absolutely. Like I think where an issue can arise, if there is one to be described between teenage use of porn, it would be developing a relationship with that, but not actually with your own sexuality and expressing that with other people or indeed with yourself aside from just using the screen. But Mm -hmm. again, as you point out, that is a result of of not having the correct guidance from those who are, who are older and, and wiser. And I wonder if there is this thing that, because for a long time, our societies, it was kind of get married young and do that. And so this sense of having, say, your teenage years, your 20s, even your 30s, even the whole of your life as like a sexually explorative time is mm-hmm. something that is, well, I don't know if it's new, but it's something that we haven't done for a couple of thousand years. I think the ancients were quite, were quite, quite kinky. In their Better own. at that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we haven't been talking about it, but I mean, people have been fucking around, right? Like, <laughs> and like, even if it was not allowed to. So it's also, again, it's all this secrecy. But yeah, I agree with you. We haven't had like this space to be like, no, actually, uh, to acknowledge. I'm just going to keep on discovering my own sexuality throughout the years. I am so happy. Like I haven't been as sexually fulfilled um, like before as when I turned 30. Like I'm, I, I tell, and I want to tell this to my younger self and I want to tell to everyone that is like figuring out stuff. I'm like, take it easy because there's, it's a long way to go. You know? <laughs> like, and you do keep learning and you do keep discovering yourself and your body and your body changes and your sexuality and desire changes. That is just so much fun i just want to make a little <laughs> celebration of that <laughs> mm. well there's this this idea that like i think to some degree our societies also fix on this idea of youth and youthful beauty and youth as mm-hmm. the kind of the pinnacle of of sexuality like young bodies early to mid 20s and beyond that point it's like it's not sexy anymore right. which well i think 
Actually, it's wrong. I mean, something I've been reflecting on increasingly recently is that sexiness is not really about looks at all. Like that's a component, but it's about a feeling. It's about like a presence that someone has. Like you can look at someone and they might be like in their 50s, in their 60s, and you'd be like, wow, like that person kind of owns it. And in fact, I had this experience a couple of weeks ago. A friend and I were at work and this guy was giving a lecture on, what was it on? doesn't matter what it was on something medical but he just had this like real presence and confidence in his way of speaking and my friend and I were like he's kind of hot (laughs) 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 and what's going on here yeah totally I agree and I think that is also that is one thing that is for example lacking in generally mainstream media like sexuality um yeah sexuality beyond like the super cliches that we see uh between people and older you know what I mean like yeah we and I think I mean it's interesting because in porn like now there is a whole actually this whole like MILF and GILF is a whole new um thing that is trending a lot which I find really interesting um but yeah definitely like if you think about like romantic Hollywood comedies right like it's always like yeah it's always mid 20 well now like mid 30s and like 30s (laughs) crisis and whatever but um yeah, but not like an accurate representation of, of sexuality and how how much fun and playful it can be beyond the 30s, right? Mm. Apart from what? like the cliche of like older guy, younger girl, you know, and like these kinds of things that we see, but not really. Also just like very shallow and not going deeper than that. Mm. I wonder if we could get to a point where, say, you guys collaborate with the big film studios and so you get like a romantic comedy with a really hot love scene that is actually like a love scene as opposed to still having the duvet in the way. I, I would want to think or believe that we're getting there, actually. I mean, we are, like, I'm also a curator for the Porn Film Festival Berlin, right? So I watch a lot of films. And we don't just uh, show films that are like officially the finest porn, but we, you know, we show a film program that has like features, documentaries, short films, experimental, whatever. Um, and the, what I've been, I started uh, being part of the creation team in 2013, so a, a few years now. Um, and what I've been observing is like, um, like five years back, say, the films, like the feature films that had like explicit representations of sex were like very independent, self-produced, no budget films, right? No distribution whatsoever, so on. The directors would like hand in the films and be like, please show my film to an audience. Uh, and now more and more mainstream films are showing more sex or dealing also more with, with the theme of sexuality, but also like showing more of it. Uh, and also these independent films are finding more funding, are finding distribution companies and so on, which is really great. Like I really, I really celebrate that. Um, so I would say there is, you know, things are changing slowly, but surely. Also porn I mean, porn has always, like, in different decades have, like, more storyline to it and more, like, feature production and so on. But that's also coming back, I think, in in many different ways, like, both from the big studios and from the, like, independent producers. Um, So I would hope, actually, I've heard, for example, that in Hollywood it's becoming, like, very usual to have a... What's it called? I think an intimacy manager or something on set. So someone that mm. coaches the performers away for the sexual or intimacy scenes. And I think, yeah, I think, you know, we're starting to show more and more. It would be, I think it would be a blessing for, again, mainstream media to like, without shame and without like, hoo, 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 show more representations of sex. Because I think they like, they do us a like worse uh, favor when this whole thing of like sex comes and then like it's like black and then next morning or what. This like skipping of the sex I think it's more harming to our like imagery and like the way we approach sex than maybe seeing like a super hardcore king scene. You know what I mean? At least there you're like seeing how things go and seeing the people sweating and like, I don't know, just sometimes it's, I think it is like, like not talking about it and silencing and like skipping it is worse than like showing, you know, whatever. Oh, it's like maybe someone might make the argument that it's there so that if a kid watched it, they wouldn't see the hardcore stuff. But then the issue is it becomes like the whole audience, it becomes the kids. No one right. is allowed to be the adult. Nobody's exactly. actually allowed to have an adult relationship with, with sexuality. Exactly. Super movie. patronizing and infantilizing. Yeah. Yeah. And I would argue that it's also like we are, like we, like people, all of us humans, we have the capacity of in imagination right and when you see something that you don't it doesn't happen to you a lot of times that you think you saw something in a film and then you go back and it's actually no they don't show it but you imagine it right 
And so I think there, there's so much projection. And I think there's what happens, like I think one like, consequence of this, like not showing sex is that what we, the most sexual scenes that we see are always related to violence. Because you see a lot of violence in films, you know, these whole like thrillers and crime, like police stuff. And then, you know, the, the, I'm going to say like the non-violent sex scenes, like you just like don't show them. But actually when there's like a rape or like, you know, something like that, there's usually you see much more of it than you would see. So it's weird. I mean, no wonder that we're all super kinky because we grew up seeing, you know what I mean? I think so. Like we grew up seeing the first like more, more explicit representations of sexuality that we see in films are always very violent. I think that's, again, that's where, or like, it's not about good or bad, but I definitely, I think that has a bigger impact on us than like maybe watching porn where we obviously see this is porn, you know, and these people are having sex, but like without a context, <laughs> than actually watching a feature film, which is giving me a context and like presenting a reality and showing me, okay, the reality out there is like, you know, hookers get killed and murdered and raped, you know, like we see that so often. And that's thing that's so much more harmful, as you say, like towards a relationship to sexuality than any super hard or kinky porn that we might have seen as teenagers. Mm. My opinion, obviously, I'm not a, not yeah. a psychologist and I haven't <laughs> understood it <laughs> from my gut's feeling. That's what I think. <laughs> hey, you do this for a living. You know what you're talking about. <laughs> right. Hmm. I'm thinking now about, well, going back to this idea of what you're doing with Lustery. And mm -hmm. I think there's this cool dynamic that seems to be happening now where the line between, say, performer and consumer is getting blurred. And I think that's happening across every area of media. It's a result of the fact that we all have computers and smartphones and cameras everywhere. And it's really cool. It means, it means people can get involved now and so shoot their own stuff, for example, which is cool. And then there, you see the backlash against it as well, like in the media about kids taking photos and how this is awful, that kids, are, kids can do this. What, what, there was some story in the UK news the other day. Yeah, I remember. Something I think to I do with something, this. Some about, kids sending pictures or whatever, no? Yeah, and it's like kids could get, Shot, or the police could investigate underage kids as if they'd committed a crime if they had sent a sexual image to another person. Exactly, because um, it would be like children pornography, even if it was like, if it's like 16 year old, you know, kids that are sending nudes to their boyfriends or girlfriends or whatever, partners. That is, yeah, I think that's a very interesting, very complicated um, topic. And again, it goes through education, right? Like just teach your kids to have use of technology in a way that is like still consensual and like you know careful and like yeah totally agree with you it's tricky but i think um i also agree with you i think it's amazing that we that this is changed i think someone had a name also for um for this like you know this like in between like being consumer and producer i forgot about it what it was but whatever anyway um, is that it is, is that it yeah maybe <laughs> I, i've seen that that might be it so, so um yeah, I think it's super fascinating. I think, but I think a lot of people also like put it down, put it down. The fact that a lot of people are like recording their own sex lives and putting it out there on the internet, just uh, like as if it's part of this like huge um, trend of just like over portraying yourself on social media, right? Which is you know partly true. I guess there is a thing with that, but also like I see it from last year, right? Like I have Skypes with all of these people all around the world, and they're like they have really different backgrounds, right? And they're really different people. But one common thing usually is just that they are doing it, are doing this also for just exploring um, their sexuality. And it's like one other, you know, facet of their sexuality, but also like trying to, to break away from these like very rigid rules that we still live in, even though since like we're so free, but maybe we're not in our heads, especially. Uh, and I think, you know, just being part of a community that is like like-minded and they're all celebrating like, you know, sex and sexuality. It's just so, there's so much more to it than just like being narcissistic. You know what I mean? I think that would be a very simple analysis that doesn't quite like grasp the, the scope of this. And um, I, I mean, I think it's just like, it's, yeah, in a way it's so empowering. Like it is, you know, it is amazing that people like that now, like many people nowadays have a smartphone and they can just shoot themselves. And it's like, 
it is a democratization of like of of media, right? In a way. I don't know. Mm. <laughs> have you ever shot yourself having sex? I I have not. I've I've sent pictures to people, but <laughs> it's uh it's definitely something on the to do list. Cool. <laughs> I'll be waiting. <laughs> yeah, I'll send it to you. <laughs> cool. <laughs> I think it's yeah I think it's so yeah it's a game changer and like you know surely there's like good and bad <laughs> or like positive and, but it's so hard to say what is really the like it's so hard to say what what is this going like what is I think we're not like we can it's like with the tubes right like the, the tubes and like all this free porn out there of course there has like a lot of uh, like negative impact in so many ways uh, but also it has shifted the power dynamics within the porn industry in such an important way, like all the, as you were saying, like all these people, these content producers. So performers before would be like officially performers and they would get hired by big companies and they would go and shoot whatever the big producers wanted to shoot, right? And now suddenly you have all these people that are performers and they're just shooting their own content and they have way more many followers than the big production companies. And the you know, porn production companies, they cannot advertise anywhere, especially now after Sesta Fosta and all of these, like you're like, they, they're, it's being more and more limited where you can like announce your product. And then, these big production companies are in need of all these performers to promote the content and reach out to their people. So it's like, it's, I mean, now I've just analyzed it also in a very simple and quick summary of it, but it's, it's such a shift of, of power and of, of structure. And it's interesting. You, know, you can't just, again, we're back at the binary. You can't just say, is it good or bad? It's, it's complex. Mm, but it seems like there's more ability to, to own the product and who you are as a producer rather than perhaps as I imagine it being going to a studio and then being like, right, we want you to do this. And it's like, okay, well, actually, if you, if you have a fan base and you have the things that you know that what you're doing anyway, I mean, yeah. in some sense, it enables you to be more of an artist with it, I would imagine. Absolutely, I think so. And then of course, it's a question like, how free are you as an artist, as a content creator? Because in a way you would say like, you can put your content out there, you can label it the way you want, right? Because before you would go to a production company and they, they're gonna like, I'll, you know, I'll shoot for a company and then they'll label me like petite, blah, 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 whatever, you know, tax fit my profile. And maybe with some of them I don't identify or whatever, you know? And then if I have, if it's my content, I'm putting it up, I can tag it the way I want. The question would be like, but I'm still, you know, I still want to sell it. And of course I'm going to sell it differently if, depending on how I tag it. So it's, you know, of course there's always like restraints and like, um, but still you do have more control. Mm. I mean, I, I would say definitely. Is there a large number of people who do this kind of stuff part-time, like have a day job, but then also do some form of set works work on the side for fun, but also for some money? Absolutely, a lot of them. Yeah, that's that's mostly. So when, on last year, we like most of our couples are not content producers. Like we have some content producers because, of course, we welcome everyone, right? Uh, but most of our couples, they this is not their jobs. They're, I mean, a lot of them like actually they write me because they want to like apply and have a profile, and they're like, how much? Like how much do we have to pay? Like they think they have to pay me for uploading their content. I'm like, no, no, guys, I'm paying you actually. And they're like, oh, that's amazing, you know. So they're, they're not, first of all, they're not doing it primarily for the money. They're doing it for other reasons. Again, mostly like exploration and just like, you know, yeah, discovering something new and so on. Uh, and this is not their main source of income at all. This is like, you know, sure, it's a little bit of extra cash and, you know, they can buy something nice, but it's not, they're not, depend they have jobs, they're not depending on this. This is not their, 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 it's really, well, I mean, this is real amateur, right? Like amateur, I think it's such a problematic term and I really don't like it and the way it's like, grown to be in the industry i think it's but we don't need to go in there but this oh, is i'm, I'm interested actually, i'm interested, like, interested. Let's unpack that. <laughs> okay so what the, re the problem i have with amateur is it's become over you know people it's become like something that is that is not what it's pretending to be right so a lot of huge companies produce amateur porn but if you take amateur as what it should mean which is like yeah people not doing this professionally but just like for other reasons but not primarily for a financial reason um, you have first you have so much pressure on performers that are actually do this professionally and main uh, to like present in a way that they're not because they need to pretend to you know be like more yeah just you know have a real orgasm and blah 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 which is you know sometimes bullshit because <laughs> this is a job and then you can do it good and it can be real because it's still real you know but 
without this like there is like there's such a like need for authenticity that it becomes like you, you just can like super fake it in order for it to be you know what i mean like there, there's this idea of authenticity and there's no way of actually that being authentic it's just you need to like fake it to an extreme to for it to pretend to be authentic it's really it's really weird i think so that's a problem um mm. but um yeah so yeah just like depression yeah it's just I, I see it so often like you have a lot of performers and they like would have sex one way but then the companies or whoever is shooting is like no can you please like change your face change don't do this because that doesn't look authentic it's like but that is actually how i authentically have sex you know but it's like no but it doesn't fit in the mold of what people think it's amateur and it's authentic you know mm. so that's weird <laughs> yeah. but still you do have you know i think if you if we would go back and be like is there any real <laughs> authentic quote-unquote amateur porn and i would be like yeah there is these people that are yeah just recording their sex lives and you know and not for a lot of for a number of different reasons not just uh their main like um job and again i'm not shaming anyone like any sex worker and i'm not saying this is better or worse than any other genre of porn like just to be clear it's just different genres. i like to call it documentary porn because i think that actually grabs like way better what it actually is like the same way that you have feature films and documentary films right you would have for me it's like you would have fictional or feature porn or documentary porn which is like you know trying so in a feature porn you'll have performers uh, performing a character um, playing out a scene and in a documentary porn you'll have um people being themselves and presenting what they usually do and you're like documenting and you know capturing that mm. my take on it <laughs> one of the things i've i've found that i actually really i, I found like enjoyed but more than enjoyed like appreciated in looking at some of the stuff that's coming out of like the ex confessions is it studio but it's actually videos where you then see conversations between the performers and the producers and kind of before and after sort of saying, this is who I am and this is what I like doing. And then afterwards, perhaps commenting on it as well. I think mm -hmm. it gives much more of a sense that oh, these are people and they're varied and kind of cool and quirky. And <laughs> it's, I think because, you know, to go back to that idea of perhaps the unconscious stuff that we walk around with about sex work and sex performers, it's like, if you just see the product itself, then it can be like, well, well, who are these people and, mm -hmm. and why are they doing that? And it's easy to fill that with the gaps that society pops up, like with, well, maybe they're fucked up. Maybe they had daddy issues. Maybe they had mommy issues. Whereas <laughs> actually, if you just see these people as as people, and I'm sure of them, like, I mean, we all have daddy issues and mommy issues, let's be real, but. <laughs> <laughs> we all do, right. <laughs> they're like, they're just human beings. We're yeah. all just human beings. Absolutely. And there's a real daddy like. So important, yeah. Is it normalization or just like an ability to, to share and feel in that space is nice. It's like, a, you know, it's authenticity, but like real authenticity and not your false authenticity. See, I agree, and I think yeah, that is really important. And I think well, that's also uh, one thing that like, technology definitely has changed so much—the accessibility of performance, right? Because everyone has a Twitter and Instagram and all of these social accounts, and you can actually talk to them, right? Which before it was like there's these porn stars, um, and they're like yeah, somewhere up there, and they're unreachable, right? And now it's like there's such a—I mean, this has changed so much. And I think yeah, I think definitely there's a lot of positives to it. Yes, yeah, the people understand this is people. This is real people. Um, um yeah we all have our issues <laughs> and why not but um you also they also deserve i mean one very important part of it i think is they deserve respect and acknowledgement for their job right and acknowledgement that their job is a job um and all of this that i think is yeah little little awareness in society as you said because of this weird narrative of like these people are fucked up and there's and yeah they're doing it for the wrong reasons or they're being exploited or whatever which is definitely like such a cliche and absolutely not you know, the majority reality of the porn industry. Mm. It feels like with some of the stuff we've been talking about and the, the lustry work and this perhaps democratization of it and ability to, to share yourself more through media, perhaps there's like a way that sexuality is becoming more communal, which I think is quite cool. It's not just limited to being what 
a couple does in their bedroom and nobody should inquire into that and they shouldn't talk about it outside of that. Like it's, it's not in a box. And what's interesting is this makes me think that one of, one of my real teachers is a philosopher and he kind of goes on about this idea that humans way back in our tribal times would have been a lot more communal with everything, including with sexuality. And it would have been much more likely that there would be big group orgies from time to time when the tribe would all fuck. And that would partly be because in order to actually control the birthing cycle, it wouldn't be good to have everybody fucking all the time because there was no contraception. But if you could just have a massive festival of sexuality, get all the women in the tribe pregnant, and then everyone knows that everyone's on the same page for the next nine months. That would be really <laughs> cool. And it would also have the whole tribe like participating in this thing together. Now, I don't know. I mean, I'm not an anthropologist. I don't know the whole like evidence for it, but it's a cool idea that actually going back deep into our past, we were much more communal with our way of doing sexuality and the way that it got boxed off is actually a deviation from something that was more, more primal. I totally agree. And I think it's so important to acknowledge that. For example, monogamy is something, it's an invention from the agriculture time, right? When suddenly you had to, exactly, you couldn't, you wouldn't communicate anymore. You couldn't like move from one place to another, but you had your land and you had to pass your land to your, you know, your heritage. And then you needed to own, to make sure that it was your children and all of that, right? And it's just like an, like an economic um, issue more than a, you know, when people are like, yeah, but it's, it's natural or it's like in our biology to be jealous. It's like, well, no, maybe not. Maybe it's really rooted in our, in our culture. <laughs> and, but I love that you also bring up this topic because a lot of people also say like, or have the prejudice that porn makes us isolate ourselves, right? Like there's so many people, which might be true in some cases, this whole thing about like you being alone with your computer, you know, jerking off and then feeling bad about it or whatever. But I think that it's just one possible aspect or way of uh, consuming pornography and then there's this huge communal way and i agree like like platforms like last Tree or spaces like the porn film festival like they bring people together and yeah i mean i'm i'm all in for like communal orgies i think we should make more of those happen fuck yeah i'm with you <laughs> <laughs> so totally yeah that should be maybe yeah 2020 new year's resolutions more communal orgies <laughs> communal orgy. anyone listening Hit me up. <laughs> <laughs> we'll make a WhatsApp group. <laughs> no, Telegram yeah. group. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually thinking of coming to Berlin later in the year, so who knows? You should come for the Pornfi Festival then. It's the uh, last week of October, so this year it's, I think it's the 20th or 21st to the 25th of October. It's a bit cold and a bit dark in Berlin, but we're very, like, we compensate that with a lot of warmth. Um, it's really like a, a meeting point for a bunch of, like, sex positive minded people and a lot of uh, producers of course and like feminist uh, filmmakers and it's really it's just like a huge celebration uh, and yeah I, I'm, I'm sure you would enjoy the atmosphere and so you're very welcome yeah that sounds wicked and if we can find some techno music as well then oh definitely it's Berlin no worries <laughs> <laughs> it's all over it's in the Beckerai like in you know everywhere <laughs> fuck yeah you know what this is feeling like it might be a nice place to wrap up right yeah, let's, let's, let's end with the idea of the communal orgy and like spread it onto the world, right? Yeah, let's check in and see how we're doing in a couple of years' time. See, <laughs> we'll make it happen. All right. <laughs> right. Right, thank you very much for talking to me. I really yeah, thank you so much. That was fun. Yeah, and well, I'll drop you an email about this porn festival. Fantastic. I'll be waiting for it. <laughs> All right, in a bit. Bye.